This happened to me when my sister was admitted to the hospital and I was left alone at home. It was my first time being alone for the night in our house. My parents had to accompany my sister to the hospital and they didn't want me to go with them because I had exams the following day. My night in the house was okay, except for the fact that I kept on worrying about my sister. When you're alone in some place in the middle of the night, you can't really help but think whether there are other creatures in there. Before, when we still had our maid, she once told me that during the wee hours of the morning, while everyone was still sound asleep, someone would twist the knob of her room, which is now my room, as if trying to enter. Fortunately, she always keeps the door locked. She had also accounted of hearing things in the kitchen being moved whenever she's already in her room and is about to sleep. My uncle also spent some time in our house. He said he saw people that are not meant to be there. As you can see, people who experience these paranormal things are those who are only temporarily resided in our home. I am a sleep paralysis prone person. There was one time that I have experienced it consecutively. Maybe because I was too stressed during that time. Usually, whenever this kind of paralysis occurs, I will be in a half sleep and half awake state. I can see the things around me, but I can't seem to move my body. There was one event though that bothered me the most. I was experiencing sleep paralysis when I heard someone and a girl's voice laughing, and it seemed that she was on the side of my bed. And that scared the shit out of me because it was the first time that something or someone was in my room while I was having sleep paralysis. When I researched further about it, according to a certain article, people who experience it usually hallucinate about the presence of paranormal things while in that state. The rest of the night went fine, or so I thought. The following day, while in the hospital visiting my sister, my father asked me whether our neighbor slept over at the house. Maybe he thought that I would have our neighbor accompany me during the night because it was my first time being left alone. And when I told him that I managed to be home by myself, he became confused because he said that when he called that morning, I answered my phone. However, I wasn't replying to him. He also added that someone just kept on laughing in the background. He assumed then that I accidentally pressed the answer button and that the one laughing in the background was our neighbor. I then checked my phone to see if he was just bluffing. But there's my call register. I had really received a call from my dad just that morning. And I'm sure that I was still asleep during the time. I could not have accidentally answered it either because my phone is over a meter away from my bed. My dad realizing that I was really alone accompanied me home afterwards. I'm really sure that the two of us realized that someone answered the phone for me. Do you think that the laughing girl from my sleep paralysis and the one who came afterwards were the same being? I don't know. This story happened about four years ago when I was 13. So to preface, my mom was leaving town for a week. She decided to send me off to a summer camp five hours away from where I lived. The camp was a week long during the summer, in the forest in the middle of nowhere, doing camp kind of things and staying in a cabin. We also had to take biology class every day. The biology teacher was this middle-aged white guy, maybe in his 30s or 40s. Nothing really extraordinary about him. So for the first half of camp, he comes off as a little bit flirtatious towards me. But I didn't really think much of it because although creepy, no real red flags had arose. About a week into the camp, all of the kids and the teachers went to a beach at a lake a little ways from our campsite to talk about the environment and whatnot. And we had to walk there. It was about 30 minutes away. Everyone was up ahead of me, 
and I was lagging behind because I had hurt my ankle earlier. So I was the last person in line. Ahead of me was the teacher, and ahead of him were the rest of the kids. And when we were walking along the beach, I noticed the teacher turns his head around, and he's staring at me, and smiling. His smile isn't completely creepy, but it's definitely edging more towards creepy than friendly. And I noticed that at his hip is his camera. To explain a bit better, he was still walking ahead of me, head turned, and smiling at me, and looking in my eyes, and to his right side, he had his camera pointed towards me by his hip. I'm like, what the fuck? And I just kind of smiled meekly and didn't do anything about it. I've always been a non-confrontational kind of person, especially since I've always been petite and average size, especially at the age of 13. And I was roughly 90 pounds. Nothing unhealthy about me. I've just always been an average height and naturally skinny. Nothing else really happens the next couple days, except on the last night, when I woke up in the middle of the night to see him looking into my cabin window. I was creeped the hell out, but he just walked away. The next day I avoided him on the way back to town. My mom picked me up, and we came back to my current place of residence. And I didn't tell anyone about it because I didn't think it was that significant. I know people might scream about how I should have come forward with this information, but I figured it wasn't a big deal since he didn't lay a hand on me or come off as a complete perv to anyone else, and I would have literally had no witnesses as proof to back me up for that. And I do regret not coming forward to anyone, but again, I didn't think it was a big deal and I never saw him again. I kind of just forgot about it until years later, until this summer. He got caught for being involved with child porn. The police found tons of child pornography on his phone and other creepy things like him being at McDonald's and taking pictures of children, zooming in on their butts and just violating things like that. He's in jail now. A creepy summer camp teacher? Let's never meet again. I had just recently found out about the black-eyed children phenomenon and was reminded of the story told to me by my grandfather of an incident that took place sometime in the late 1918 or early 1919 near Sandoval, Illinois. He told me it had been hot the past summer and the heat lingered for months. So he had all the windows and both doors open in his house where he was sitting on the porch reading a book because it was too stuffy to be inside. He went in to make a snack and get a drink when he heard a knock. This struck him as odd because most people would just call out. Most people knew him. So we figured it was a vagrant looking for a meal or labor. He lived by the train tracks so hobos would come from time to time. And I guess it was normal. So he goes to the hall and two kids are standing in the entrance way and they call out. May we come in to rest? It's a long way home. So he says they were welcome to sit on the porch, but it's too hot inside to be comfortable. He asked if they came from the rails, and they just said, We need to come in. May we? From what he said, the kids made him feel weird because they wouldn't look at him directly, and they were just too clean. My grandfather said that riding the train was dirty. You got grease on you and coal dust, and sometimes you get cuts on your hands or knees. He even lost a leg doing this very thing, which kept him out of the war. But these kids, from what he said, were pristine, like they were going to Sunday school. They weren't sweating, and their hair was neat. It struck him as odd. If they had walked in open fields in the middle of the heat, they would be unkempt or disheveled. He asked again if they would like to sit on the porch. And the girl, it was a boy and girl, but the boy didn't speak, just repeated, May we come in? And then she just kept saying, May we? May we? May we? 
over and over again until my grandfather slammed his hand down and says, Damn you both, no. The girl stopped speaking, and he said they both just stood quiet until the girl looked at him, eyes black as coal, and said once more, Mister, may we please come in? My grandfather just walked to the kitchen and sat down not knowing what to do. He said he felt like someone punched him in the stomach. He said he just sat there until his dog came rushing in the house, shaking like a leaf. So at the end he never told anyone, chalking it up to heat exhaustion, but he said it troubled him for years. And my question is, how far back do these stories of black-eyed children go? From what I've read, they can sometimes hypnotize people. Could they do that with a dog too, to keep it from barking as a warning? My boyfriend and I are big gamers, but since university has started back, we haven't been able to spend a lot of time together. Well, one Saturday, we had planned to go to the flea market I'd heard about and go game hunting, and spend the rest of the day playing together like we had over the summer. While we were there, I found a classic Legend of Zelda cartridge, and knew I had to have it. I'm a huge Zelda fan. I know this sounds cliche, and you're expecting me to tell you the worker said I could just have it, but not to bring it back, with an odd tone in his voice. But that's not what happened. I paid for it, and was told I had a week-long warranty if I found a problem with the game, to bring it back, and I could have another copy, or another game, of equal or lesser value. After my boyfriend and I strolled around the flea market for fun, and he bought some beads that expanded in water, he said we could have a bead fight once they got big and squishy. We got home, and we popped the cartridge into my Nintendo and began to play. After two hours or so, we stopped and ate dinner at Red Robin's. When he dropped me off at home, he told me to go find some secrets in the game, but he was heading home for the night. When I got back and turned on the Nintendo, I saw our file had been erased. I thought, great. Its battery ran dry. I'll have to take it back when the flea market opens up again next Saturday. But to double check, I made a new file and saved it, then turned it off and back on. And the file was still there. I sent my boyfriend a text telling him this, and he said he didn't mind restarting because it was only a new reason to spend another whole Saturday on my couch, spending time with his favorite person. So I continued with my day. And the next day I come home and the kitchen and bedroom lights are off. I usually leave those on for the dogs. And I also found the tulip scented wax that I put in my scent lamp splashed on my pillow. And I called my mom to see if she had come home from work at any point in the day. She said she hadn't. So at this point, I'm a little creeped out but brushed it off. I mean, maybe I forgot to leave the lights on, right? So a few weeks go by and things are pretty normal until one night I'm playing video games. Mom had a date that night and told me she wasn't coming home, so I'm playing my Xbox 360, and out of nowhere, I hear my dog yelp and look over to see one of my Nintendo controllers had flown across the room and hit my dog who was now hiding in the corner with the controller at her feet. Now that, I couldn't brush off with a possible reason. So I shouted, if you're real, Stop hurting my dogs or I'm getting rid of the cartridge. And ever since then, the dogs haven't been hurt. But my door locks keep coming undone. The air conditioning switch keeps getting shut off. And the TV will turn off. And if the door is cracked, it'll slowly be shut with a rough slam. Could this really be my game cartridge? Even though the spirit has calmed down, I don't know if this is something I should allow to continue. My name is Adrian. I was 13 when this story happened. Me and my other friend, also 13, got bored and decided to take a walk through the woods before the sun set. It took us about 15 minutes to reach our fort we had made. The forest was super dense 
and the woods were often dark even when the sun was out. So it was always a little spooky to be there. After we reached our little fort, me and him had been talking about comics and toys for a while and didn't keep track of the time. All of a sudden the hair stood up on the back of our necks, but we just ignored it. We felt safe because we were at a fort we made long ago. It's one we always go to, on a really big tree. We call it the tree because it's the largest, oldest oak around and it's hard to miss. We started hearing very faint talking and after a bit we started to make out things like Come here and help but in a very odd raspy voice. We shrugged it off and I didn't realize it until I had checked my watch that it was five minutes until sunset. We were having a good time at our fort so we decided to stay. We heard those noises again but this time they were louder and an almost spot on impersonation of me and my friend but slightly deep and raspier. We both heard it loud and clear now and decided it was really time to head back. We started hearing rustling and louder voices now and they sounded very close. I heard right above me the phrase Help me! in a really croaky and raspy voice. I had asked my friend where the hell it came from. I asked him in a very concerned voice, where the hell did that come from? He was staring above us, eyes wide open. He let out a blood-curdling scream, and while running away he shouted, On the tree! I yelled back before running, Which tree? I still wasn't spooked enough to run and didn't know what was going on. Above me I heard breathing noises and smelled a mix of what smelled like morning breath and blood. I felt hot breath and connected the dots very quickly. I was frozen still, but then I just darted through the woods, quickly catching up with my friend. I ran for 15 minutes straight all the way home and my lungs were on fire. I didn't realize how tired and out of breath I was until I finally stopped running. I was just lucky to get away. As soon as we got home, I asked him what he saw, but every time I did, he would black out for a little bit and start staring. When he snapped out of it, he would tell me something like, shut up, or it doesn't matter. To this day, he hasn't told me, and I've never mentioned it again. And we haven't been back at our fort. I could only imagine what there was with us in those woods. I'm thankful I got away. I was reminded of this by an upcoming storm and I figured I should share this story. This takes place about four years ago, right at the beginning of the biggest snowstorm of my life. It was February, and in my home state of Massachusetts, were no strangers to snow. At this point, there was already a good foot of snow on the ground from previous storms. Right before the storm started, I figured I should dig up some of the snow that had been collected in the chicken run. It was early morning, and as I was getting ready to go out, I noticed that the motion sensor light had gone off next to the chicken coop. I looked around the yard from my window and didn't see anything. As I went to the door, my cat Alfred got in front of the door and was looking at me. He was a strictly indoor cat so it wasn't like he was asking to go outside. I gently moved him aside with my foot but he got right back in front of the door. He usually wasn't like this so I thought it was strange. I figured he wanted attention so I picked him up and sat him on a chair. I went outside onto my back deck. Now, my yard is pretty narrow. A maybe 30 foot by 200 strip of grass and a garden that has been slowly being taken over by the forest behind my house. At the end of my yard there was a steep hill covered in trees that led up to the rest of the forest. The chicken run was about 10 feet from the deck so I went over and got to work. 
letting them out for a bit and feeding them before starting to shovel. When I was about halfway done, one of my chickens, a Rhode Island Red, started squawking. I've heard these chickens squawk before, but my two buff chickens always did this before they laid an egg. Yet, this was more of an alarm call, and I hadn't heard this type of noise since my dad's dog tried to attack them. I was outside the run, dumping a bucket of snow into a pile. I looked up at the chickens. They were all along the back of the fence of the run, looking at something on the hill. I looked at the top of the hill and, and what I saw still gives me chills to this day. There was a big black dog-like thing sitting at the top of the hill, staring down at me. I froze looking back at it. I knew the animals in my area and the only two possibilities that would make sense for this to be is a fisher cat or maybe a coyote, but, but they were both too small to possibly be this. We stared at each other for a few minutes, its yellow eyes glowing in the early morning light before it stood up on its hind legs and turned and ran into the forest. I ran back into my house, slamming the door shut and locking it. I still don't know what that thing is, but I'm reminded of it whenever the motion sensor lights go off or my neighbor's dogs start barking. I hope to never see it again. The following is a story my grandfather used to tell me before he passed away. I'm no World War II buff and I'm just retelling this story the way I remember hearing it so I apologize if some dates and locations may be slightly off. My grandpa was a British infantryman in the Second World War. He was only about 19 years old when he enlisted to serve his country. And while he thought that joining the military would give him opportunities to see exotic locations around the world, he was never deployed anywhere he really wanted to go. Instead, he ended up practically in his own backyard, Switzerland. This is just some historical information, but it's important to understand before reading the rest of this story. Switzerland did its best to maintain neutral status throughout the war, but regardless of its attempts to maintain neutrality, Switzerland was still highly sought after by both the Allied and the Axis powers. Once the Nazis began committing acts of aggression against Switzerland, England provided reinforcements to the Swiss military. Yet in an effort to prevent open war within its borders, the Swiss government instructed its military and the British reinforcements to perform a series of tactical retreats into the Alps. That's how my grandpa found himself stationed in a remote village in the Swiss Alps. At this time, it was early in the winter of 1943, and my grandpa's company was stationed in a secluded village of about 500 people. Part of the advantage they had that, with this location, it was really hard to get to and therefore had little chance of being spontaneously invaded by Nazi Germany. But this was also a disadvantage because it made communication with the rest of the Swiss military very difficult. The issue with communication was further compounded when sometime in early December a series of blizzards swept through the region and completely destroyed the few lines of communication they had in the first place. So essentially, trapped in this isolated Swiss village without being able to make contact with the rest of the army, my grandfather's captain decided it would be best to uphold the standing orders and continued defending the village. Weeks passed and any roads to the outside were buried in seven to nine feet of dense snowfall and any telegraph phone lines that they had were equally useless. It grew deeper into winter. The leaves were stripped from the trees and the bare trunks protruded from the mountainside like broken ribs. The town was nestled between two large mountains. Sunlight only directly reached the town for a few hours each day making the soldiers feel as if they were living in a state of perpetual dusk. One night, my grandpa was at the town bar with a few of his friends from the company, and a group of locals approached them. One of them in particular was visibly upset. 
All of the Swiss people in the town grew up speaking German and none of them were used to having Brits around. So one of them began speaking in broken English. Where? Take you the children. Luckily, one of the guys my grandpa was drinking with spoke pretty fluent German and was able to act as an impromptu translator. After several minutes of confusion and yelling, the translator turned to my grandpa and the rest of the soldiers and said, They say some of the village children have gone missing and they want us to do something about it. Now obviously, the British military doesn't exactly act as a bunch of mercenaries for hire, so my grandpa and his friends told the villagers to come back to the headquarters, which was really just a makeshift barracks they had thrown together in the town's church, to talk to the captain. Due to the language barrier, the villagers' discussion with the captain took about two hours, and basically what the captain and his self-designated translator was able to piece together was that a few weeks after the company entered the village, the locals had noticed a variety of bizarre incidents. At first, it was just benign stuff like vanishing pieces of wood and tarps from people's sheds. But over the following two months, people realized that valuable items were being stolen from their homes. One man claimed that his family heirloom, a handmade ceremonial halberd, sort of like a traditional Swiss war axe, had disappeared from above his fireplace mantle. The culmination of all these incidents was when a village child went missing. Of course, many assumed that the child's disappearance, although tragic and disconcerting, could be attributed to something as simple as the boy falling into a snowdrift while playing outside, or possibly being attacked and killed by a wolf or other predatory animal. But there wasn't only one child that disappeared. There were several. The villager who entered the bar who had looked especially upset. That was the father of two young boys who had gone missing two days beforehand. He had searched everywhere for them. He even rounded up a posse of his fellow townspeople to join the effort, but they couldn't find a single clue as to what had happened to the children. The captain told the villagers that he would continue to look into the matter and that he would begin sending some of his men to patrol the streets each night, looking for whoever, or whatever, was the culprit behind all the strange thefts and abductions. Later that same night, Private Reginald disappeared from the barracks. Disappearing children was one thing, but a grown man? It seemed unlikely that an animal, even a wolf, could have taken down a healthy, full-grown man on his own. Naturally, rumors began to surface that there was some sort of monster living in the mountains that came down at night to feast on the occupants of the village. Despite the nightly patrols ordered by the captain, the disappearances kept occurring. Reginald was the only adult victim of whatever was preying on the village. The rest of the victims were all young kids between the ages of 5 and 10. All in all, including the original three kids who had gone missing, seven children vanished from the town. Many people in my grandpa's company were growing suspicious. One explanation that they got passed around was that impoverished villagers were actually selling their own children to human traffickers for extra cash, but even that didn't make sense because the roads into and out of town were still blocked by the snow. Three more weeks passed without incident. At this point, it was early spring and the snow was starting to thaw. That night, coincidentally, when my grandpa was on patrol with several other soldiers, they discovered what was behind the children and Reginald's disappearances. It was sometime past midnight when my grandpa and his comrades noticed a figure peering through the bedroom window of one of the villagers' homes. My grandpa was at the opposite end of the street, so at first the figure looking through the window didn't see the patrol. My grandpa and the other soldiers yelled at the prowler, and it immediately tore itself away from the window and began running away. Everyone in the patrol was certain that this was what was behind the disappearances and break-ins. They ran as fast as they could in pursuit through the melting snow and ice in the dead of night screaming at whatever it was to stop. 
They kept running and running and soon found themselves on the outskirts of the village where the snow was still fairly deep. The figure jumped into the ground. It looked like it had just vanished into thin air at first. But as the patrol grew closer, they realized that the prowler had actually just jumped into a cave that had been hollowed out inside of a snowdrift. Just as the soldiers began yelling into the cave for the figure to come out and show itself, several gunshots exploded out of the entrance to the snow cave. Without thinking, my grandpa and the rest of the patrol shouldered the weapons and all began firing into the hole. Afterwards, there was silence. They waited for what seemed like hours, but was really just a couple of minutes. One incredibly brave member of the patrol volunteered to climb into the cave and investigate. He drew his pistol, kneeled down, and crawled into the cave. Several seconds later, he emerged, with a completely horrified expression on his face. My grandpa took out his flashlight and shined it into the cave when he saw the gruesome explanation behind the strange occurrences in town. The figure that they had been chastening was Reginald, the private who had gone missing weeks before, and they had shot him right through the heart. The cave was not only occupied by Reginald, though, but also the bodies of seven partially eaten children. Either due to the stress of being snowed in all winter, living in near constant darkness, or maybe some sort of terrible mental issue, Reginald had gone completely insane and had begun breaking into villagers' houses and snatching their children from their homes in the middle of the night. He had used the halberd that he had reported missing to dismember the bodies. After he cut the children and slit their throats, he hid them into the cave carved into the snowdrift. This happened when I was nine years old, but I still remember it as though it happened yesterday, if you can pardon the overused cliché. It was the middle of January, and we were having the worst snowstorm recorded where I lived. Needless to say, all of the schools in the district were closed. Around noon, I went out to simultaneously celebrate the rare snow day and revel in the snow with the other kids who lived on my block. We all trekked down to the nearby playground. I suppose it was because there was more unsullied snow there. At one point, the group decided to try and build an igloo, but... I quickly lost interest as it was not holding together, and I was tired of being bossed around so I separated from the group to a fresh patch of snow several yards away. I was going to make a snowman. I had just finished the first ball and was already bored and thinking about rejoining the group when I looked at the snowman again. I saw that there was an older boy standing near it with a grin on his face. I noticed that there was something a little strange about him. His clothing seemed old-fashioned and somewhat ragged, but I didn't mention anything. In fact, we never really said a word to each other, but by the end of the afternoon we had finished our snowman. I took off my hat and put it on the snowman's head, and the boy unwound his thick woolen scarf from around his neck to place it on the snowman. When he finished, he smiled at me, bent to kiss my cheek. I remember that his lips were cold, but... That didn't seem weird to me at first. After all, we had just spent all afternoon playing in the snow. He gave a little wave and turned around to walk away. One of my friends called my name and I turned to look. They had all given up on their igloo and were heading back home. So I followed and didn't give another thought to the strange boy until later. Over a mug of hot chocolate, one of my friends commented on how quickly I'd managed to build the snowman. I laughed and told her that it wasn't that hard since I'd had help. A strange and comfortable silence fell over the group, and one of the other girls said they hadn't seen me with anyone. I rolled my eyes, figuring they'd form some sort of collective pact to freak me out or something, sort of a way to get back at me, but I let it drop. The next day I went back to the park where we'd been playing. Most of the area was covered in footprints and evidence of my friend's attempts at that igloo. But as I approached my snowman, the footprints thinned out. 
I couldn't believe my eyes. There were no footprints there at all, whatsoever. Not mine, and not the boys. The snowman stood alone, surrounded by white snow, untouched except for the tracks where we'd been building the snowball bases. So weird. I stood there for a moment, looking around in case the boy was standing nearby. No one was. The snowman still wore my hat. I went over to it and retrieved it. After a moment's thought, I went back and unwrapped the scarf from around the snowman's neck to place it around my own. I still have that scarf, and to this day I wear it during the winter or whenever I'm feeling lonely. My wife and I have been running the rat race for years. A family, a house in the city, two dogs and a cat the stereotypical American dream. But the city took its toll. The neighborhood got worse. The crime rose. And we found ourselves looking for a way out. Our opportunity came when I was offered a new job out of state. It was a great career move, but we didn't want to move to a new city just to have the same problems again. So we started looking around and found a great mountain community about an hour and a half from the job. A great ranch style house with a big back porch, windows everywhere, and a lot of property. The backyard has a big grassy area and a creek that cuts the property in half. Then acres of woods beyond it. It's huge and the house is more than twice the size of our house in the city. It's all updated and has no neighbors within a mile. It was a radical change from the life we had lived in the city. But best of all, it was less than half of what we were paying for our old house. The house was a foreclosure, and when we asked the agent about it, they simply said the old family had abandoned the property. We really didn't think anything of it. The first three months were uneventful. With us settling into our new life, the kids getting used to a new school and new friends, and most of all, us getting used to the big house and property. But then the weather turned cold and things started to get weird on the property. It started with noises from the back. Things we chalked up to being in the woods. Then the motion lights around the house started going off randomly. Once again, we just chalked it up to being in the woods. But last night it all changed. Last night was the most terrifying night of my life. One of the dogs was at the back door whining and scratching. I assumed he needed to go to the bathroom. I grabbed my flashlight and walked out the back door. Instantly, something felt off. The dog bolted for the back property, growling and snarling. It was a cold night about 30 degrees, but the dog plunged straight into the creek and out the other bank, running off into the woods behind the property. Flashlight bouncing, I ran after him, calling his name. I got to the creek and made my way across the makeshift bridge, trying desperately to follow him. I could hear the dog still growling and barking from somewhere up ahead, and I pushed further away from the safety of the house and deeper into the woods. That's when I heard it. A shriek like I've never heard before in my life. It was a mix of moaning wails and metal on metal. It echoed through the trees and froze me in my tracks. My dog bounded its way back to me and covered down behind me. I turned around and could just make out the warm glow of the house behind me and the cold dark ahead of me. I swung my flashlight around wildly, looking for the source of the noise, and that's when I heard an even more terrifying noise. Out of the cold silence, my wife's voice floated all around me. Babe, the voice called out. I whipped back around and could just barely make out the image of my wife, safely inside of our house. The voice called out again. Babe, I'm right here. 
the voice came from deeper into the woods. Then came another voice, just as clear as the other. It was my dad's voice. Come out here, it called. I swung the flashlight around again and this time caught the briefest glint of light bouncing off of eyes. The creature was in my beam of light for barely a second, but it was tall, maybe six feet and ashen white. It had long, spindly fingers that grasped the trunk of a pine tree, and then it was gone. I turned back and ran towards the house. I ran headlong into the icy creek and stumbled. My dog ran past me and, making it back to the yard and up the porch, I dug my hands into the freezing muddy bank and pulled myself out, not stopping to look back. When I reached the porch, I scrambled inside. My wife ran over to me asking what had happened. I just shook my head. I'm not even certain myself what had happened. I was driving alone in a national park, very far from people, on a bright full moon night, a huge, clear moon, the kind of moonlight you can read by. The road went straight along the bottom of a wide, flat, mostly barren valley, then banked up and sharply left onto the ridge. It was about 10 p.m. and I drove through the valley on full alert watching for animals and loving the scenery in the crazy bright moonlight. When I hit the curb and went into that sharp uphill left, I saw something through the side of my window. Something white. It was rapidly getting larger in my vision, as though it had been moving parallel to me. But the turn in the road meant I was now in its path, so I turned my head and looked directly. It was white, man-shaped, but without genitals and completely naked. A deathly nauseating white with a greasy shine, completely hairless. It was crawling on its hands and knees, but it was half the size of the car, and it was coming so very, very fast. It had a rubbery face, distorted by hate or a scream. Black eyes that reflected the moonlight. That look on its face, I can't even tell you. I can still make myself feel sick from that memory. I believe that it was intelligent and it wanted to tear me apart with its teeth. Its speed was horrifying. It went from being a small white spot to spitting distance in the time it took me to make that turn. When I unfroze myself and hit the gas, it was on the road. I braced for it to run into my car door, but then it was gone. The rear view mirror showed me nothing. I've never told anybody. I've seen a few minor glitchy ghosty things over my many years, but nothing has ever frightened me like that. It was looking at me, and I don't know what it was. I can't seem to find any reference to anything like it. and. I wish I knew if this thing was something from folklore. I'm a male and was in sixth grade at the time. Our family just moved into a new house, so we hadn't fully unpacked. The house had one of those finished basements, so there were a set of stairs that led down to it. Once in the basement, with the stairs directly behind you, off to your left was a small bedroom with a single closet, and in front of you was an abnormally long, skinny room. The long, skinny room was the length of the other two rooms in the basement. On your left side, at the other end of the room, but still along the same wall as the door, was a very small closet. On your right side of the room in the corner was a window. Well, essentially a window that you can jump down to and let you access the basement room. 
Most of our furniture was unpacked, but we still had a lot of cardboard boxes that were stacked up in the long room. I didn't admit this to the other people, but I was actually quite afraid of being left alone in the new house, especially at night. So right as my parents were leaving, I turned off the lights in the basement and closed the door and just hung out in my room upstairs. Around 20 or 30 minutes after they left, I heard a fairly loud noise, like a smash of some kind. I froze and listened in case it happened again, but there were no other noises. Something didn't feel right, so I immediately called my parents and told them what happened. They helped me calm down and told me most likely a box that was stacked up had fallen over but they had already turned around and were coming home just in case. While I was talking with them on the phone, I walked downstairs to the basement and turned on the lights to the main room. I then walked to the door of the long room with the window and unpacked boxes. I opened the door and had to turn on the light to see anything. Sure enough, a few stacks of boxes had fallen over. I told them it was nothing, but they were still on their way home. I said I'll see you when you guys get here in a little bit and walked back upstairs. Once they got home, my dad and I went downstairs to pick up the boxes. When we opened the door, my skin went completely white and I just froze. There were no boxes on the floor. They had been restacked. My father checked the window well and the lock didn't work. It could easily be opened when you thought it was locked. We used some wood to jam in the window so it could not open and he went through and checked the rest of the rooms in the house. I don't know who or what was in there and restacked those boxes, but it still gives me chills to this day. This happened to me when I was about eight or nine years old, and to this day, it is one of the most disturbing, confusing encounters I have ever had. It was a very hot afternoon during summer vacation, and I decided to have a lemonade stand down the street from my house. My friend and I rode our bikes two blocks away and set up shop. A few hours passed and she decided she had to go home for dinner. It was starting to get a little dark out, and I was left to pack up the little table and the lemonade pitchers by myself. Then, a man walked up to me. He was about 30-something years old and had a very strange expression on his face. Like he was smiling and wide-eyed. He walked up very close to me, and I'll never forget what he said. What would happen if you had no skin? I was taken aback and just responded, I'm not sure. Then he said, what would happen if you had no heart? Then what would happen if you had no toes? What would happen if you had no eyes? He kept getting closer and closer to me and still had something very, very off about his facial expression. I was naive and young, and although I didn't realize how creepy this really was, I felt really uncomfortable and started grabbing all of my stuff because I had so many things I couldn't ride my bike home. I had to wheel it next to me. When I started walking away towards my house, the man started following behind me still not saying anything except for asking me what would happen if I didn't have certain body parts. When I sped up, he did too. He eventually trailed off and every time I looked back, he was just standing on the corner looking at me. I never told my parents and I never saw him again. I was honestly more uncomfortable and confused than I was scared, but now looking back on it, I wonder, was he just a mentally handicapped harmless man, or was he some kind of dangerous disturbed man? 
regardless. I still hope I never run into him again. This happened in 2006 when my husband and I had just started dating. It was Christmas Eve and we had gone to the pub to celebrate with some of his friends. Almost as soon as we walked in the door, one of his friends approached him, looking agitated. She said she had something to show him outside, so the two of us followed her out. She took out her digital camera and showed us a photo. It was of three young women, smiling, standing with their arms around each other's shoulders. To me, it didn't look like anything out of the ordinary. But I had just moved to town and didn't know any of the women. My husband seemed puzzled too at first, before his friend broke in. This was taken tonight. I watched the color literally drain out of his face. Fifteen minutes ago, in there, she said. They both started kind of freaking out looking at the camera, then each other, then back at the camera. By this time I was super confused, so I asked what was going on. My husband explained that one of the women in the photo had died from cancer the year before. The other two were her sister and best friend. My husband's friend was really torn about showing the other woman the photo, and together they decided not to. I thought this was the wrong decision, but I didn't really know any of them very well and didn't feel like it was my place to intervene. I was later introduced to the two women and can confirm they were wearing the same clothes as in the photo and the interior of the pub also matched. I don't know if the friend ever showed them or what happened to the photo, but I looked at it a number of times that night and I was sober, as we had just arrived. And I know there was a third woman there. I'm 40 years of age, male, and a product of the 1970s. At an early age, my dad left me and my mom, so I always felt like I had to be strong for her because she was always crying on my shoulder about how our father left us and deserted us. And I was only four or five. Anyways, mom met a new guy fresh out of the Marine Corps. They got married soon after. We moved to a place called Del Camino, a trailer park just east of Longmont, Colorado, next to Highway I-25. We'd lived in a single-wide green trailer on Grove Street. My room was at the far north part of the trailer. My parents' room was at the other end, and in between was the kitchen and living room. I was about eight years old, when one night while in bed, I heard someone calling my name. It was soft and comforting. I walked down the hall trying to figure out where the voice was coming from, and it sounded like it was coming from outside. So I unlocked the door, opened the screen door, and walked out onto our big red patio that my stepfather had built. When I got to the edge of the patio, I looked over and saw that there was nothing there. And I mean nothing. There was no ground. There were no cars. There weren't even any other trailers there. It was just the patio and me. I remember freaking out, crying out loud. And then all of a sudden, something grabbed me. When it did... I felt an extreme pain radiating throughout my entire body. Suddenly I came to and I realized that I was outside on the patio naked as my stepfather was spanking the hell out of me for going outside at 2 o'clock in the morning. It was pretty weird, but not as weird as what happened the next night. After dinner and a movie, we watched Superman with Christopher Reeves and then I went to bed. Instead of dreaming, I was Superman flying around or something like that. This is how it went. 
A voice, soft, comforting, calling my name. This time, coming from my window. My window faced the street. I had no curtain, so it was always lit up in my room a little from the orange glowing street lights. But when I opened my eyes to see who was calling me, I noticed the room was really bright orange. And I sat up in my bed, which was directly across from the window. And through the window was what looked like an orange glowing egg, about 10 feet in diameter, floating above Grove Street, about 10 feet off the ground. I couldn't figure out what it was. I didn't even think of a spaceship or aliens at the time. I just watched it hover. Then it got even brighter like the sun. I felt heat on my exposed skin. I got really scared at that point, but I couldn't move. I felt frozen, sitting up in the bed facing the object in the window. Then I felt a tingling sensation all over me. I looked down at my chest and noticed small ant-like insects, but they were metallic, about the size of ants, but they looked more like tiny rectangles. They were crawling all over me, my legs, face, chest, and arms. I couldn't move, I was so terrified. Then the robot ants just disappeared into thin air all at the same time the same time that the light dimmed and I could move again but for some reason I laid back down and pulled the covers over my head the voice was no longer there but I felt a presence in the room with me I was petrified I began to think that I've got to get into my mom's room quick but I was so afraid of whatever was in the room with me that I was having a really hard time getting the courage to do it Finally, I gathered enough guts to throw the covers off, jump up to my feet, and I looked out the window. There were four beings, just like these so-called greys I hear about, in the middle of the street. They all turned and looked at me at the same time, and in one split second, one of them was at my window, staring at me. Its movement was so fast that I couldn't even see it move from the street to the window. I freaked out and screamed and started to turn and run when I heard a crash in my closet. At that point, I wasn't sticking around for the next surprise. I hightailed it down through the hall, through the kitchen, jumping over the couch and straight into my mom and stepdad's room. He wasn't too happy, but... Mom knew I was really upset, so she gave me a blanket and pillow and I lay down on the floor next to their waterbed. I was feeling calmer and started to fall asleep, then I heard something in the room. I screamed for my mom, but nobody woke up. I said it louder and neither one of them woke up. I heard shuffling in the room and then a bang against the waterbed. I looked down towards the foot of the bed and suddenly a big ugly insect-like head popped out. I blacked out and when I woke up it was the next morning. I was still really terrified by what I had seen, but I didn't tell anybody. I've had many other experiences. This was just the first one. I've had an intense phobia of alien images since an early age of five, the first time I saw E.T. I can look at pictures of the alien franchise Xenomorphs no problem, but the more gray-like and spindly they are, I physically feel just sick looking at them. I used to have sleeping problems, with two reoccurring nightmares of seeing a UFO in the sky outside of my room at my parents' house. I then rush downstairs to check the conservatory is locked, and it isn't. When I go to grab the handle and lock it, I see a very long-fingered gray hand grasp the handle. I always wake up then. The second dream was literally me just being in a room with a six, seven foot tall gray, and a ridiculously long, 
limbed spindly gray that takes up almost the whole room. It was impossible to look away from it, no matter how hard I tried. I took sleep therapy and eventually learned a few little life-saving lucid dream hacks so I could change the dream or wake myself up as soon as I noticed the reoccurring features beginning to manifest. When I came to tell my parents about the sleep problems, my mom revealed that she'd seen something similar. She swears up and down that a week after my birth, she checked on me every hour during the night to see if I was still alive because I was born premature. One night, I had been particularly bad and she came in and swears up and down that she saw a wingless angel who took up the whole room, standing over my bed and bet doubled over. She stared at its face and remembers nothing else but an androgynous face she can't even draw. She said without moving its lips, somehow, it told her everything was fine and she could go back to sleep. She did and she thought it was an angel back then, but now she's not so sure. For a while, none of the nightmares bothered me, but in 2013 that changed. It was November, and I wasn't at my family home anymore, I was staying at my student flat. I woke up from a nightmare in which aliens were trying to get into the house. I was living with five other people, the first thing I did was check my door. I had a safety lock on it all the time, especially when I slept. It hadn't moved. It was about 6 a.m. and I didn't have class until 12, so I listened to my iPod until I could go to sleep again. When I woke up from my actual alarm at 9, I went to open my curtains and I found a handprint. Only it couldn't have been human. Fingers were long three or four times the length of a human. I remembered staring at it for a good few minutes, feeling sick. I don't even have long nails and never will because I'm gross and bite them. The shape, it was so distinct and it really weirded me out. I woke up the three other housemates still at home and they honestly did not know what to make of it. I think one girl figured out immediately why I had turned down the downstairs patio door bedroom when we'd been assigned rooms. Way too many conservatory flashbacks there. I wonder if anyone else has ever experienced anything like this before. To this day, everyone kind of just brushes it off with, wow, that's bizarre. But, I mean, it honestly scares me. The idea that something could have been in my locked room next to me and done that and also wondering if it has anything to do with the thing my mother saw or whether she was maybe just sleep deprived. I have no idea why an alien would fly that amount of distance to come leave a weird shape on my window, but maybe I'd rather not know. It first began when I was seven years old. One summer night I was trying to sleep, and I thought we were having an earthquake. I sensed a presence outside of my window and a strong, shaking, rolling sensation as if we were having an earthquake. It felt like it lasted for a minute or so. The next thing I know it's morning and I'm lying in my bed. First thing I asked my parents about is if they felt the earthquake last night. They said no, and I thought that was odd. I went for a swim in our pool and experienced some pain in my genitals. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I had small incisions and white things under my skin which I was able to remove. It was painful, especially in the shower or the pool. I was young at the time and thought maybe this is what a wet dream was. So I told my friends on the way to school that I had a wet dream. When I explained the details, they said that isn't a wet dream. As time went on, I started to think I may have been abducted by aliens. Years went by, and I always remembered that experience and wondered about it. Since then, every so often, at least ten times now, 
I've woken up with strange and unexplainable cuts on my skin. They are straight lines two to five inches long, red and lightly scabbed, but they always heal quickly. They usually occur in places that I can't even reach like on my back. Once I woke up covered with 30 plus scratches, my girlfriend at the time noticed them and asked about them, but I didn't have an explanation. She was sleeping in the same bed with me when it happened that night. I've woken up with these scratches off and on over the years. Sometimes it seems like years go by and then I'm... Just when I think things will get normal again, I wake up to a new set of them. I am currently married. A couple of months ago, my wife and I were sleeping. My wife woke me up in the early morning and was disoriented. She said she went to bed with her clothes on, but now she was naked and couldn't find her clothes. She said she also heard weird noises outside our window and had very strange dreams. I woke up with the weird scratches on my skin that morning as well. I've never shared with her my experiences or beliefs, and I don't plan to. I have no memories of ever seeing an alien. But logically, that's the best theory I can come up with. I have not yet undergone hypnosis to try to recover memories, and I don't really think I want to. I would rather this never happen to me, and it's somewhat scary to think about. Overall, my health seems fine, and if they wanted to harm me, they easily could, but they seem not to. I have no real interest in going to any UFO conventions or anything. They seem mostly full of crackpots, and also, once you associate with that group, it has a negative stigma, and people think you're crazy. Most of the information I have found online has been interesting, but I am skeptical, as there are a lot of weirdos out there, so I take everything with a grain of salt. I hope that one day this will all make sense, and I'm now in my 30s. I'm currently running a camera in our bedroom when we sleep. I'm not really expecting it to work if this ever happens again, but I figured it can't hurt. This takes place in 1976 or 1977 in the Madera area of Clearfield County. This would have put me at about six or seven years old at the time. We lived just above the town of Madera. It was very remote. Few homes in that area and very wooded. My dad would often patrol with the local officers from the game commission. I'm pointing this out due to the fact of how he reacted when we saw this thing. He was a big guy and very little scared him. We often shook our heads when he would go outside at night to scare off a bear with only a pitchfork. He knew wildlife, knew what their habits were, knew if they were going to be a problem on the farm or things like that. On this night, we were awoken by a loud commotion near our front porch. We had outside cats that hung around on the porch and they would scatter when a raccoon or other animal would approach. When they scattered, it was quite loud, hence the noise that woke us up. I remember hearing Dad giving his typical angry sigh because he had to get up and see what was out there. He had gone downstairs. The house was quiet. We were all waiting to hear the door shut. Instead, we heard Dad let out a bellow. This had us all running for the stairs. He was standing back from the door, gun in hand, and his face was, well, I guess you could say scared. As I've said before, nothing seemed to scare Dad, so seeing that look on his face made us all stand there uncertain. Outside, standing in profile, looking right back at us with no fear. In fact, I remember thinking it was angry. It just looked mean. It was a canine but certainly not a dog. It looked like a hyena from the front shoulders to the head, but the back end was way smaller than the front shoulders and the head. I don't remember seeing a tail. The fur was odd. 
sparse and shaggy. It just didn't look like fur. It's hard to explain. The snout was not long and narrow. It was stubby but big. And the whole body was huge. From its back end to its head, it was almost the width of our porch. This would have put it at at least seven feet long. It was huge. It stood looking in at us, then looked out towards the barn, back at us again, and then just simply and very slowly walked a few feet. Then it took off. It was so fast, like literally just seeing a blur of color, then it was gone. We all just stood there. Then Mom asked Dad what it was, and Dad yelled for us all to get upstairs. He stayed up all that night, never went outside to check the animals, never even opened the door. Oddly enough, we never talked about it, and nobody ever mentioned it again. I wish I had more information to give you, however, this does give you a possible timestamp. I spent most of my life up there in that area. It was a unique area for sure. Many things happened up there that were unexplained and I was glad to move away when I was 33. I do still live in the Clearfield area, but no more forests. We were out on a Navajo Dam Road cutting wood. We had turned onto a dirt road on the northeast side. After cutting a few trees at the bottom of a canyon, we decided to go further up the hill to see if we could find any more dead trees. I had a dog and my son with me. We made our way up the hill and it flattened out a little bit. There were a few dead trees so we decided to stop and cut those as it was getting dusk and colder out. My son and his dog got out and were playing fetch while my brother Chris and I prepped the trees to be cut. As we were about to finish up, my kid came running up the hill and said he found some really neat looking tracks from an animal. So as I made my way down the hill and towards my truck with an armful of wood, I stopped to look at the tracks. They looked like claw marks in the sand and were in the same direction as where we climbed to cut. As I was looking at the tracks, I noticed I didn't hear my brother's chainsaw anymore. As soon as I realized the motor sound had stopped, I heard a scream. The sound of a shotgun being pumped, then a shot being fired. Before I could even react, Chris came running at breakneck speeds down the hill, past me, and to the truck yelling, Drop the wood, let's go. My dog was barking growling and backing up with hair raised on her back and neck. I shuttled my kid and dog with wood in hand down the hill, through the wood in the back seat with the child and dog. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there. My brother refused to speak until we were on the main road and almost home. While he was cutting wood, he had the feeling of being watched. Thinking that I was playing a trick on him, he sat his running chainsaw down and went to catch me in the act before I could scare him. Not knowing I was further down the hill with my son, he climbed the rest of the hill and was looking around to find me. He saw us down by my truck and also saw a shadow opposite him by a sandstone cluster to his right. We always carry a gun with us while we cut, because you never know what kind of creatures one may encounter out there. He pumped off a shot to get my attention and also took a shot at whatever it was he had seen. He told me it ran in between a rock and ledge and some bushes. He didn't want to waste time and try to take another shot at it. Before the second shot, the chainsaw stopped because it had run out of gas, which is how I was able to hear the gun being cocked and fired. It scared him so bad that he refuses to go back out that way and collect wood. And always being the skeptic, I thought he was bullshitting me, trying to scare me, but... Then I remembered the claw marks my kid found, and knowing that nothing scares my brother or my dog, he said the thing he saw was a good seven feet high if not taller, and hairy all over with a wolf's face and eyes. He caught a slight glimpse of it before it slipped between the brush and stones. I was kind of laughing at him in my head, and 
how I remembered those claw marks in the ground. Me and my two friends decided to go camping in southern New York, up on a mountain. There was a dirt road that runs right down the mountain, then off of it were a lot of smaller off-road tracks that have some really good camping spots. I don't know if you're really supposed to be camping there or not, but there's a lot of fire pits, so people seem to do it anyways. Anyways, we set up our tent and got a fire going, had a couple of beers and are bitching about our women and the sun goes down. We all looked at each other because the woods got really quiet. You couldn't even hear the crickets. Everything just went dead quiet. It felt like there was a lightning storm coming because you could feel the static in the air and and all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Jamie started saying that he felt like the air was humming and all of a the sudden there was this real deep bass noise and this bright light in the distance. It flashed up and lit the whole woods. It looked like the light when a real big firework explodes for the first few seconds, but it lasted for probably a minute before it split up into three or four outer lights and shot back down into the trees. We could see all of the lights glowing out in the woods and there was a big gust of wind and it was gone. Everything smelled like it had just rained, but it never did. We didn't know what to do, but we figured we would just wait it out, but nothing happened. We thought maybe it could have been a meteor or something, so we left it alone and went back to bitching. At about 2 in the morning, we decided to turn in, so Jamie and I went to go sleep in the tent, but Dan said he was going to sleep by the fire. An hour later, I wake up because Dan is in the tent shaking us, saying that there's something big watching the camp. He said it was about 50 feet from the fire and he thought that it might be a bear, but it was standing on two legs and bobbing back and forth like it was trying to get a better look at him. While he was talking, we heard a loud scream. I've never heard anything like it before as long as I've been alive. It sounded like a pig being slaughtered but deeper, and so loud it made your ears ring. Next thing I remember was hearing three or four more things come running towards the campsite and the embers from the fire kicking up and landing on the tent. The things or creatures or whatever they were kept running up to the tent and grunting and running back into the woods. Every once in a while one of them would scream again and pull on one of the tent poles dragging the whole tent a foot or two. The tent was collapsing on one side and we didn't know what else to do, so we just started screaming as loud as we could. It only took a minute and then everything was quiet again. We made a run for the truck as fast as we could and hit the gas. When we were leaving, we saw one of those things in the headlights standing in the road. I told Jamie to just gun it and the thing straightened up and puffed its chest. It must have been eight feet tall, it had dark gray hair all over its body except the front. That hair was white or yellowish around the chest. Its face looked kind of like a dog, but not really. I know what Bigfoot's supposed to look like, and this was way different from that. It didn't even move when we drove at it. We had to swerve around it or we would have run right over it. We drove back down the mountains of the highway and parked the truck in a gas company parking lot. We were going to tell the cops what happened, but we didn't know if we were camping somewhere we shouldn't be, and we had been drinking all night and couldn't afford a DUI. We just waited for the sun to come up and sobered up, then we drove back up to get our stuff. There wasn't anything there and everything was gone, no tent, no cooler nothing. We told some of our friends what happened and they won't believe us since we'd been drinking so we just decided to forget about it. If someone ever wanted to check it out I could take them right to the place it happened. There's still tracks there from where we peeled out and lots of big gashes in the dirt from where the tent was but nothing else. I don't know if it had anything to do with the lights we saw but 
It was the weirdest damn thing any of us had ever experienced. And it was definitely not a bear. My mom remarried about two years ago. My dad died when I was 12, so she had been widowed for over 10 years. This new relationship was very whirlwind with them meeting, dating, and getting married within three months. I didn't know much about the guy, but my mom was happy so I just tried to be supportive. She moved into his house in upstate Virginia and invited my fiancé and I to spend a weekend in her new home getting to know her new husband. My mom's new home was pretty isolated. It sat on a few hundred acres of lovely rolling hills and was very picturesque. I was nervous about getting to know this guy, but really trying to make the most of it. Over the course of our first day there, though, I felt more and more uneasy. I didn't think it was weird, just silly. My mom's new husband was being very welcoming and friendly, and we were made to feel very at home, yet I still couldn't shake this oppressive feeling. I finally chalked it up to me being more upset about my mom getting remarried than I was willing to admit to myself. We spent most of the day wandering around outside since I felt worse when indoors. That night, my fiancé and I showered together. When I turned my back to him, he stopped talking mid-sentence and asked, what did you do to your back? Well, nothing why, I responded. He said that you have a large bruise. I hopped out and tried to see it in the mirror. I got back in and we finished showering in silence, then went off to bed. The one window in our room looked out over a pitch black empty field, but I couldn't sleep until I hung something over the window. I was sure that otherwise someone would watch us through the window. The next morning, I had a complete meltdown. I woke up and just couldn't stop crying. I told my fiancé we had to leave. He tried to calm me down by telling me all of the things I had been telling myself. My feelings of anxiety were just a result of seeing my mom with someone else. The longer I spent with them, the easier it would become but I just had to leave. It was only Saturday morning and we were supposed to stay until Monday, but I felt completely hysterical. I knew I was on the verge of a panic attack and my only concrete thought was that I had to stop crying long enough to make our excuse and get the hell out. And that's exactly what we did. As soon as we were on the road, I felt like a weight had been lifted. I was even feeling embarrassed for my behavior hoping I hadn't insulted my mom's husband leaving early. Then my fiancé broke the silence. That bruise on your back. Did you get a good look at it? I had. It looked like someone had touched the middle of my back with fingers spread wide, with their hand at a tilt. I wanted to make this completely clear. No one had touched my back the previous day, especially hard enough to bruise me. Cut to three weeks later, my mom comes to visit me. The entire time, she's hounding me to come stay with her again. After finally trying to change the subject for the fifth time, I level with her. Before I've even finished telling the story, her face is white as a sheet. She tells me she's been feeling the same way in the house and she hates it. She wants them to move as soon as possible. And the real kicker is... Her new husband's previous wife shot and killed herself right outside in the same field our room's window had overlooked. When I was very little, my parents would let me stay up late on the weekends and watch TV until I fell asleep. I really loved these times, and I would stay up later than anyone else just because I could. Well, one night I was almost asleep on the couch when I heard a noise on our front porch. 
It was the sound of our old-fashioned porch swing moving back and forth. I was a little scared, so I crept towards the bay windows of our living room and peeked out towards the sound. Sitting on our front porch was an older woman, probably in her 50s, wearing nothing but a nightgown, covered in blood, and holding a huge kitchen knife. I freaked out immediately and ran screaming into my parents' room, but I was too terrified to form words. My parents saw that I was upset, but when I was finally able to tell them what I saw, my dad got really angry and told me that it was just a dream and to go back to bed. I refused and kept crying and screaming until he had enough and snatched my arm and dragged me towards the front door to prove that there was nothing there. I kicked and screamed the whole way, trying to make him stop, but he kept pulling me. Finally, we got to the door. He unlocked it, swung it open, and said, See, there's nothing there. To this day, I've never seen the look of fear and shock that was on his face when that woman turned and stared at both of us and slowly stood up with the knife. My dad slammed the door shut and got my mom to call the police while he went and got his gun. He went back to the door with a 12 gauge and cracked the door enough to stick the barrel out. He asked her what she was doing and she said, Somebody killed my husband, but it wasn't me. My dad told her the police were coming and she freaked out, grabbed the knife and walked away. I never slept in the living room again. not sure how freaky it really is since it's not paranormal or anything but when I was about seven years old I went for a walk with my babysitter we were walking back a mile or so from my house on a fairly busy road and about halfway there she says we should play Simon says at first we walk faster then skip and then jog lightly. Then she says, Simon says, run as fast as you can. Simon says, turn here. I was slightly confused, but played along. As we turned down the driveway, I looked back and saw two guys chasing after us, one with a bat and the other with a knife. We ran up to a house and some old people living there let us in, thankfully. At the time, I didn't grasp how fucked up it was that we were getting chased. And I still have no clue why they were doing it. I moved into my dad's when I was 10. I didn't know anyone in the area except for the family my dad was friends with a single mom with three kids. Luckily, there was a girl a couple years older than me, 12 at the time I met her, and we got to know each other a little bit over the couple years I was there. We weren't close, but ended up having the same friends. One night my friend Rob was hanging out with her and her younger brother. They happened to be in the house alone because my friend's mom was at work, which is where this story gets terrifying and sad. Her mother has been helping this one lady through her work and got to know her fairly well. She found out her sister was in a mental institution and was let out recently. The night Rob is hanging out with my friend, they get a knock on the door. My friend thought it was just their mom. She knocks a certain way when coming in and answered it without thinking. Rob wasn't supposed to be there and he took off through the window to his house down the road. He didn't even think twice about it. But it wasn't her mom. It was the sister of the lady her mom was helping. And she figured out through talking to her sister where her family lived and her mom's work schedule. She came inside and this is where I don't know many details and I'm kind of glad I don't. 
my friend's younger brother got away to the neighbors to call the police. The lady brutally murdered my friend a week from Christmas, decapitated her, and left her body naked in a bathtub. Hit her head and they had to look through the presents to find it. I wasn't allowed to go to the funeral. There's an abandoned house next to mine. The previous owner moved out to California 25 years prior and never sold it. One night, I get a flashlight and gloves and push the window open and went inside, starting with the basement. In the basement, there was a grand piano. It still played but was very much out of tune. Old World War II stuff and what seemed to be a signed Elvis poster and some other really cool shit that no one would ever leave behind. There's basically a whole story in that basement, including a broken wedding picture frame and instruments everywhere. On the main floor was an unmade bed. Molded food, still in the fridge and on the stovetop. Half-empty beers turned solid and lights that hadn't been turned off. I started walking upstairs when I heard crying from one of the side rooms. That's when I freaked the fuck out. I haven't been back there since. When I was a freshman in college, I was on a film shoot near Route 66. We were shooting on the property of a cafe known for the film Baghdad Cafe. The property has an abandoned motel attached to it, which is where we were shooting this unbelievably bad horror film. The motel's floor was full of papers, something I initially figured was a relic from the past, while the hotel was still actually doing business. A while into the shoot, we started picking up the papers and reading them. They were handwritten letters from the 70s, perhaps never even sent. They were addressed to dozens of different people. They started out normal, but went on to describe some really, really fucked up things. This was a guy who literally had some demons. He kept talking about how they were watching him and things like that. The handwriting also got more and more messed up as we assembled the letters in chronological order. Meanwhile, outside of the motel, there was a strange storage container with keep out spray painted on it naturally we were curious there was a hole in the side and someone reached in and pulled out some documents among them was a letter on government typeface telling the person who wrote those crazy letters that he was unknowingly a participant of some tests of hallucinogenic substances while he was in the army the whole time, there was a room in the abandoned motel that was sealed off. We were strictly forbidden from entering it. All the windows were covered by plywood and the door was barricaded shut. It smelled like death. It was seriously the worst smell I'd ever encountered in my life. To this day, I don't know what was in that room. I can't even explain this one. I was in 7th grade, and it was a typical after school day. I was at my friend Maria's house. It was about 6pm, and Maria and her mom had gone to the corner market to get something real quick. I said I was fine staying there alone. I watched half of a movie and then I got bored. It was about 6.45. I decided to do something that wasn't meant to be played with. Bloody Mary. Now, I know all the stories you've heard, maybe you believe them, but at the time, I thought the story was stupid. I read how to play it, and I went into the bathroom. I stepped on the cold tile of the floor and looked at myself in the mirror. I started daydreaming and going into a daze, thinking. I turned off the lights. It had no phone on me. It was just me, some candles, and the mirror. I grabbed the lighter in my pocket and set the candles on fire. I set one candle on the corner of the sink table. I set the other in front of the mirror. The third, 
I held right below but in front of my face. I stared at the mirror and said slowly, Bloody Mary. It took me about 30 seconds just to say the bloody part. I was starting to get kind of scared. I tried not to wimp out, but something told me to stop. I didn't listen. I refused. I wanted to know what she looked like and if she was real. After the first time I said her name, I said it again. This time, taking me even longer to get the words out. I started feeling hot. My skin felt like it was going to melt, burst into flames. I thought about all the horrible stuff. All the bad stories I had heard about doing this. The whole meaning behind her and... I saw a spark behind me, behind the shower curtain. I started to say my third Mary when my heart felt sick. I felt dizzy, but I was curious. I wasn't going to give up. As I started to say my last Mary, I was super hot, shaking, and just really scared now. I could barely stand up. I very slowly said bloody and this sharp, piercing cold wind and chill came across me out of nowhere. It all happened so fast I didn't even realize the curtain had opened, but I did notice an ugly figure in the corner closet. I saw her face. She had a very weird and creepy smile. Her skin was cracked. She was bleeding from her eyes and had a pale face, thin lips, dark eyebrows and blackish hair. I started regretting everything. I wanted this to stop. I wanted to just go and dance and be happy and not be where I was. She started coming closer to me. As I looked in the mirror, she comes closer and closer, holding both her arms out towards me. I saw a white light and my face began to sting. My heart felt like it was going to explode. All of a sudden, she stopped and put her fingers to her lips as if she was telling me to be quiet. The door swung open and the light turned on by itself and all the candles blew out. I stood there breathless, motionless. Maria asked me, what are you doing? She saw the mark in the mirror of a handprint. She noticed how wide I was and, to my surprise, the curtain was back in place how it had been when I entered the room. I collapsed and luckily she caught me. I told her what happened and she believed me. A month later, she moved away. I've never played the game since then. You can believe me or not, I don't care. I know what I saw and I know what I experienced. This is a very touchy subject for me. The whole Bloody Mary thing is true, and I know it is. This took place in a small town on June 22nd, 1999. In the Moreau Evening Newspaper, there's an article about my best friend Mike. We were only 13 at the time, you know, the age of curiosity and the first time hearing the legend of her. It was around 10 or 11 at night. The moon was covered by trees, so there was very little light. We both wanted to try it out, but to this day, I'm glad I never went in with him. He went into the bathroom by himself. He thought it wouldn't work if we both tried at the same time. The legend we heard was that you had to light six candles. Write 666 on the mirror with anything red. We used lipstick and say her name six times. My friend did these things. I heard him say, Bloody Mary. Nothing happened for ten minutes. He didn't make any noise, and I could still see the lights from the candles under the bathroom door. I didn't think much of it and went downstairs to get something to drink. When I came back, I was a little worried because I could see no candlelight and the bathroom door was locked. I pounded on the door, until his dad asked what I was doing. His dad believed that we had accidentally locked the door, so he got his lockpick set. When he got the lock undone, 
the door was stuck. When we pushed on it, after about 15 minutes of pushing, there was a thump, and when the door opened, my friend was kneeling on the ground, and his head was in the sink. My friend died doing this stupid legend. So please, don't any of you make the same mistake. My friend had a slumber party, and they dared her to do Bloody Mary. You know, go into the bathroom, turn off all the lights, light a candle, and chant her name 13 times, and she'll appear. For about 15 minutes, nothing happened. Then we heard her scream, and she tried to get out of the bathroom. The door was stuck, but it didn't have a lock on it. Whenever we got her out, she was crying and whimpering like a madman. We asked her what happened, and she showed us her arms. There were all these scars that had never been there before, at least 20 of them. A few days later, they disappeared, and she won't tell us what happened or what she saw when we ask her about it. She just looks at us in a hateful way. One time, she said she wished it would have been Jenna that did it, because it was Jenna's dare in the first place. This is a very true story about you know who. I never speak her name anymore. That happened to me one night when my parents were away. My older brother dared me to do the ritual and summon her spirit, and I didn't believe that it was true, so I did it, thinking it would be good for a laugh afterwards. I went into the bathroom, turned off all the lights, turned around seven times while saying her name on each turn. Then I stopped turning and faced the mirror. I waited in silence for something to happen. I was about to give up and leave when I heard a woman singing. I turned slowly back to the mirror and I saw her. She had long, dark brown hair that was soaked in blood. Her neck looked like someone had just slit her throat. I screamed instantly. My brother started banging on the door and turning the lock. She became angry. She was smiling at first, but now she frowned and reached out through the mirror with one bloody arm and slapped me, scratching me on the right side of my face. I felt her nails strike so hard that I was knocked to the floor and my head slammed against the side of the bathtub. I was unconscious. When I woke, I was in the hospital with bandages across the right side of my face. My brother was whispering apologies to me that I could barely understand. My parents were also there. As soon as I opened my eyes, they rushed to my side. I discovered that my brother had told them that one of my many cats had scratched me and I had fallen. I'd been scratched by my cats before, so they believed us. On that same night, we got a call from my aunt. My uncle had died in the same hour that I was attacked. I know it could just be a horrible coincidence, but... I believe that she killed my uncle. Every story I've ever read has said that she will only come attack you and not your loved ones, but I don't care what the stories say. I still think she killed my uncle. The attack was a year ago, and to this day, I still can't see out of my right eye. A couple of years ago, I was at school and some of my friends were talking about the Bloody Mary myth. Angela dared me to go into the school bathroom and do it. So about five of us piled into the bathroom and locked the door. One girl turned off the lights and everyone got really quiet. I stood in front of the mirror with everybody surrounding me. I chanted her name and said I killed your son 13 times just like in the myth. Nothing happened, so... All of us started to chant. We got up to seven times and then we heard a bang coming from one of the stalls. A small flickering light appeared in front of the mirror like a candle. It gave us just enough light to see each other. I was looking into the mirror and it looked like Angela was bleeding from her eyes. One girl started to get a nosebleed. 
and all of a sudden the hair on my left side turned red. I normally have curly hair, but when it's wet it goes dead straight, and the red part of my hair was hanging totally straight. When I touched it, I realized that my hair was soaked to the point of dripping with blood. I screamed and tried to turn on the lights, but they wouldn't turn on. We tried to unlock the door, but the door wouldn't budge. We heard a high-pitched scream come from the mirror. The lights came on and the door swung open all on its own. We all ran out, and to this day I still have a small scar in the back of my left earlobe that looks like a scratch. I don't recommend you try to do this ritual at school or even in your own home, but if you do, be careful. Draw a ring of salt around you and don't break the ring or step outside of it. It's better to be safe than sorry, and as it turns out, we didn't use this precaution. I was only seven at the time. A few friends and I went to a bowling alley. Now our parents belonged to a bowling group, so we just chilled at the arcade part. One of the other kids told us a story about Bloody Mary. My friends and I didn't believe them. So me and two of my friends went to the men's restroom. All we had was a flashlight. We turned off all the lights and chanted her name over and over. My one friend then flashed the flashlight on and quickly off. I looked at the mirror and there was a girl. She looked like she was in her early 20s. She was looking the other way yet started to turn towards us. My friends and I bolted out of there before she attacks us like the legend says. After this experience I feel like someone is always watching me. I haven't tried contacting any other spirits after this. A few months later, my dad died. Could she have driven him crazy enough to kill himself? Could this spirit be so full of rage it drives people to shoot themselves? Ever since this happened, my moods are different. I'm 15 and some days I just suddenly go into depression. Some days I just want to curl up and die. Could this be her revenge for summoning her all those years ago? My friends who did this with me all stopped talking to me. I met one recently and he seems okay. I wonder if I was the only one that seen her that day. I wonder if she's only after me. If she is, I don't know why. This may have happened a while back, but I can still feel the after effects. Last night, I was watching that 70s show reruns, eyes heavy, and a mind in a daze. I was starting to fall asleep when I woke up to what I thought was a loud <laughs> by the patio door. The chocolate chip cookie I was halfway through slid off my hand, somersaulting down my torso, as this noise brought me to an awakening twitch. Just an animal, I thought or the house settling. Eric Foreman is so goofy. Donna is way out of his league. Eric is lucky. I like this show. Back to sleep. <laughs> this time from the ceiling, I shrieked. What the hell is that? This time, I sit up with upright posture, like I'm ready to focus on any minute detail that strikes my senses. I turned the kitchen light on, just out of a general state of fear, without really any concern about anything actually being in the kitchen. I checked the back deck from the thump from before. That's super weird, I think. Nothing else happened, and I started to relax. I'm not really worried at this point, but still a little bit on edge. I'm a college student, spending the summer at home with my parents working in downtown DC. They went to the beach, and I'm home alone in this rather large house. It's 10.36 p.m. Seriously? I think. Now again, if I were on the set of a horror movie, or had been watching something scary for that matter, 
I would have drawn an immediate connection between the thump noise and the door knocking, unusually late at night. But neither of these things applied to me at that moment, so I didn't. I was still kind of anxious, though, from those thumps. But when the door knocked, my attention immediately forgot about this noise. That was likely nothing to worry about. Probably a salesperson, or a mailman. I remember one time a few years back a UPS man rang our doorbell at like midnight to drop something off. I was the only one awake so it scared the shit out of me then. Maybe it was something like that. The most likely scenario would be my buddy Frank, who considered coming over but said he was too tired. He can be a little spacey though sometimes, so I guess he could have changed his mind without telling me. I guess I'll go over there and at least tell whoever the hell it is that I'd like my privacy. Unless it's Frank, of course, who I will then remind how spacey he can be. Though I am weirded out a little bit by the situation, so I grab the first thing resembling a weapon I can get my hands on. An old lacrosse stick. I hold it from the head, with the shaft facing outward, kind of like a lightsaber. As I turn the corner to my foyer, I see through the door side windows a pair of skinny legs with odd, worn slippers. Alright, this is a little weird. That's definitely some skinny chick. Maybe she's confused, trying to visit a friend and knocked on the wrong house. The house next door is about the same size, and doesn't really look a lot like mine. But I don't know what else this could possibly be. All of this enters my mind in the matter of seconds between my footsteps in the kitchen and the doormat between the front door and the rest of my home. As I stand between the large modern door and whoever the hell is out there, I lean my lacrosse stick on the ground behind me so the stranger won't see it. As my hands float hesitantly towards the doorknob, I hear a voice coming from the other side of the door. No clear words. Just the light whispers. I assume someone must have been there with the slippers girl, because I haven't even opened the door yet, and as far as I can tell, this person hasn't even seen that someone is home. Unless she's talking to herself. That thought didn't calm my mind at all, though. My hand stopped frozen in midair, about halfway between the rest of my body and the door, like I was doing some weird robot dance move. I waited for several seconds, disturbed by the odd synchronization between my movements towards the door and the voice outside. I wait longer. No more voices. I take a deep breath in through my nose and out through my mouth. I open the door about three quarters way, quickly, like a toddler, anxious and curious to discover the monster in their closet. I stick the right half of my body out, facing two dark feminine figures on my front porch. The first thing I notice is those beat up slippers. I look up from there, my head and neck tilting upwards to see the rest of her. Straight black hair, uncombed, matted in different directions. She looked sickly, shaking in the cold, with a hooded sweatshirt and tiny khaki shorts. She's about 5'3", looks 13 years of age, staring straight forward, which for me, at about 5'9", standing on a raised surface above my lowered porch, is at my pelvis. In the dark, I cannot make out the features of her face, but could tell something about her was awkward. The way she stood there, off balance, her neck tilted to the side like a chewed up overused doll. Before I could react in any way, I observe her partner, about a half a foot behind her and to her left. A noticeably younger girl, maybe nine years old, but with about an inch on her older sister, wearing a ragged dark blue skirt 
black pants, and rain boots. She had similar black hair, though she didn't have the same bizarre demeanor as her sister. I look down at these two girls and have no idea how long it's been since I opened the door. Have they said anything? What do I say? This is fucking weird. Um, can I help you two? I muster out. In the tone I typically use talking to kids, but without an undertone of chill in my voice. I stutter some when I'm nervous or excited, and here I can barely make out a word. Hello, sir. Please, we're cold, and we would like to use the phone, the younger one says, her head facing straight forward. Her tone. It was like nothing I had ever heard. It was feminine, sure, but each word left her mouth fully independent of the one before, like they were just words being spit out of a machine and placed in the correct order by a third party. Almost. Like a robot. But she was clearly human. A young girl I am speaking to. Yet somehow, very, very off. She didn't sound her age. She sounded at least 14, maybe 15 but she looks no older than ten. And why did she speak to me, and not her older sister? What's going on? Is her older sister shy? Mentally handicapped? Am I dreaming? And what does she mean about using my phone? It was like she was speaking off script, and mixed up her question. Did she mean to ask me something else? Not sure how to respond to this arbitrary question I manage. Um... Well, I'm not sure what you're asking. Are you two lost? First, nothing. Just stares. Straight forward, directly ahead, as if with no visual awareness. And the younger one. Please, sir. We are alone and need to call home. Let us in. Her response with the same monotone voice, didn't really answer my question. It was like she was speaking without any concern over what I was saying. Just when it was time for her next line, and the last part, let us in, like a command, completely separate from her prior, polite, candid requests. Trembling in fear, and confused, with a strong sensation telling me something was horribly wrong, I said, I'm sorry, but I cannot let you into my house. You will have to just stay here while I grab a phone and call for you. And I couldn't leave these two kids just stranded out here. But I knew. Something in the pit of my stomach just told me. I couldn't let them in. I was scared shitless. And the two just looked straight forward, not responding. And suddenly the older one, who is yet to move or say anything changes her expression completely. She squeezes her fists as they shake at her sides, as if in great pain, and without moving her pale face or neck, makes a smile, showing all of her teeth at once. They were sharp, inhuman, like an animal's. At this point, I made an obvious loud scream of terror. The younger one notices my fear and looks up at me. And her pale face. Her eyes. Blackness. Pure black. No clear iris or retina. Just like two black marbles. I then notice her silent, smiling older sister's black eyes as well. A grotesque nausea floods my stomach. Closing in on me choking me. I am frozen. I do not manage a scream. I can't. I am lost in my fear. My entire body speeds up, tingling and numbing. And finally, after what feels like several minutes, I let out a noise of horror that I don't think I've ever made as I close the door in front of me and retreat to the safety of my home. My body is still shaking, and I stand, crying and trembling in front of my door. I needed to reach my cell phone, 
which was in the family room. I can still hear that 70s show in the background, which brings me some relief. But it sounds off now. Foreign, almost like another language in my fearful state. I need to call the cops. I can't let them in. Get the fuck out of here! I yell while banging on the door in an attempt to scare them off. Undiscernible sounds come from the other side, like animal cries or barks. It doesn't really sound like the younger girl. I know it isn't. I know it's the older girl. The silent, mentally off one. But I can't fathom this. Fuck no. I need to reach my cell phone, but I can't move. I can't lose track of them. I can see the slippers in the side window, and I know she's still there. More animal noises come from outside. I scream, yell, bang my lacrosse stick against the door. Anything I can get out of my tired lungs and muscles. I felt like I was being attacked by a grizzly bear. I was in full-on survival mode, doing all I could to scare them away. But any noise I made was matched by the older girl, with her disturbing barks and screams that to this day haunt my dreams. Then, from the other side of the door, I hear a muffled, We just want to call our mother, from the younger girl. Please, we are scared and alone. Let us in. Let us in. And the last part, let us in. In the exact same canvas, twice over like a recording. Please let us in, like a chant. Let us in, the younger girl continues. Each command louder and more assertive than the one before. As the girl's noises match her demands. I wait for any sign of safety, or of this horrible nightmare coming to an end. I continue screaming at them until it finally stops. The noises and the chanting gone. The slippers are gone. I look out my window. Sprinting legs. The older girl. Running the speed of a male track star. With her legs twisting over each other like a circus freak. This is so fucked up. I see her trail off. Catching up with the younger sister who must have been given the orders to leave while she stayed for a minute or two barking. Screeching and yelping like a Neanderthal. I watch as the older sister finds her younger sister, waiting on the other side of the road. I stand there, not looking back at my house, staring straight ahead the other way, like they are waiting for something, or someone. And suddenly, a large, wiry figure walks towards them. Long legs and arms, and lanky, inhuman features, with the shape of a woman but far too tall and awkward in form. Like one of those scarecrow-like animation figures from a Tim Burton film. This creature, or better yet monster, leads them away into the night. I did not leave my front door the entire night. I didn't sleep, and I barely have since. Close family, my girlfriend, and my friends want to believe me. They say they don't think I'm crazy. But I feel like they don't really believe me. This is actually so fucked up. Whatever it is and whoever they are, it's real. They're like these subhumans trying to take us. Or have us join them. I don't know. Whatever it is, they create this energy of fear and terror like nothing I have ever experienced. I lay awake terrified that when I open my eyes, that older sister will be outside my window, hanging from a tree, smiling at me, and barking, waiting for me to walk outside and leave the house. And it's been a few days now and I've managed to leave, at the request of loved ones. Each hour that passes, I do feel a little more safe. I know this sounds like something out of a horror movie, but it's really fucked up and the realest shit I've ever experienced.
I'd woken up in my dorm room. It was a stormy night around four in the morning, and still, quiet dark, though there was a yellowish-orange light from a street lamp outside. The window at the foot of my bed had been left cracked open and was banging in the wind. I got up to shut it and stumbled back to bed. Lying on my right side facing the wall with my eyes closed, the hallucination began. I felt as if a pair of slightly clammy hands with thick fingers were gently stroking my face, my lips in particular, then my eyes and ears, and prodding at my mouth. Eventually this feeling gave way to prickling pins and needles all over my body and I felt very cold and I had a strange buzzing feeling, almost as if I were being electrified or covered in static shocks. At the same time, a heavy ringing began in my ears, very loudly and in an even tone. It was at this point I got the sensation that there was someone else in the room very close to me. I was able to open my eyes and felt the weight pressing down on the left side of my ribs and shoulder. The light from the street was blocked by shadows and I realized the shadow had a solid form. A squat creature with cat-like features and claws, though humanoid and compact. It was about three or four feet tall, sitting on top of me. It had pointed ears and pale yellow eyes with no pupils. I couldn't distinguish its face beyond the outline and its glowing eyes. I knew it was a demonic force of some sort and I tried to scream. I felt the air leaving my throat but only heard a faint whisper. I don't know how long this lasted, but eventually the apparition was gone and I was able to move. I got up and turned on my bedside light and sat up awake until dawn. I have a few different sleep paralysis demons and one sort of sleep paralysis guardian angel. The demon ones are the usual shadowy figure standing over me or by my bedroom door. The worst one was while I was lying on my side with the back to the door it felt like someone got into bed behind me under the covers and put their arm around my waist and it felt like they were cuddling me and I could feel the breath on my neck. It felt like they were there for about half an hour. All this time I was trying not to show that I'm panicking because it feels like I'm getting spooned by a skeleton with claws. It was only about the second, maybe third time I've had sleep paralysis so I nearly had a heart attack. This thing felt like it was moving in closer and closer to kiss me behind the ear. Then it whispered, Not yet. You're not ready yet. I'll come back for you when you are. To me, it sounded disappointed and excited. Felt like it was slightly telling me it meant that it was coming back when I was about to die. My sleep paralysis guardian angel was a weird experience. I've been getting sleep paralysis on and off for about 18 months by this point, so I could usually tell straight away when it was happening. At first, I thought it was the usual demon things beside my bed. But when I looked properly, I realized I could clearly see a man kneeling next to my bed and smiling at me. It wasn't a creepy smile. More like a parent coming to check on their child. He looked like he was dressed in a 50 style suit and hat. He didn't say anything, although I got the sense he was letting me know everything was alright and he'd look after me. I started experiencing sleep paralysis early in junior high. It stopped roughly four or five years ago. I'm going to tell you about the last two episodes I ever had. It happened two nights in a row and 
Both nights my ex had actually experienced something while awake during my episodes. During my episode the first night, I had seen my usual shadow figure watching me, crouched at the foot of my bed. My ex had woke up and jumped out of bed running out of the room, which had woke me up. I asked him about it, worried that maybe someone had tried to break into the apartment. He just said he would talk to me about it in the morning, and he ended up refusing to tell me, so I let it go. The next night during my episode, I see the usual, except it was almost midway up the side of my bed, still crouching. My ex wakes up again during this episode and gets out of bed calmly. My episode ends and I wake up shortly after when he was getting back into bed. I ask him what he was doing and he said he had seen a tall shadow come from the wall and hover over me like it was going to harm me. And he got up and started talking to it, telling it that it wasn't welcome and needed to leave, which prompted me to ask him if that's what had scared him out of bed the night before. He said it was and I told him about both of my episodes. He knew I suffered sleep paralysis and had always assumed what I was seeing were just nightmares or night terrors. But since he told this thing to go away, I've never again had an episode. Is it just me or does it sound like something had attached itself to me for several years? Maybe my bad childhood and all the negativity had invited something and I never realized it until my ex shoot it off. This may not seem all that paranormal, but for me, I consider it to be. I don't remember how long ago it started. I'm bad with time like that, let's say a year and a half ago. I was reading up on shadow people, astral projection, and sleep paralysis a lot. Constant reading. I was interested in it all, so quite coincidentally, Around that time, I started experiencing it myself. Sleep paralysis, that is. The first time was dreadful. I couldn't move and I had no idea what was happening. I felt watched and scared. I started to panic and sweat. The feeling of being observed grew stronger, so I fought the inability to move as hard as I could till I gasped out and was able to sit up. Nothing was there. The feeling gradually left, terrifying yes, but it got much worse. I experienced it a few more times, which weren't too bad, I just couldn't move. Then we get to the scariest experience of my life. My bed faces a dresser with the TV sat on top, and on the wall, right of that, is a closet that had the door open. My bed is on the left wall. I woke up on my back which was strange considering I always sleep on my stomach and again I couldn't move. Looking against the wall I see black tendrils start to emerge from behind the TV and the shadows created by the open closet door. They reached out towards me and a sound of white noise filled my ears. Then the room started distorting shifting and moving, different objects moving forward or going back, and the tendrils kept reaching out. It was very frightening to say the least, but I didn't panic this time. It's hard to describe, but I knew it wouldn't hurt me, based on the first bad experience. Eventually the distortion stopped and the tendrils receded. After that, I had experienced the paralysis many times. Each time I would be calm and try something new. First I could blink, then move my fingers, then my arms, and finally I could make small vocalizations. Often I would pass out on the floor and wake up to find my mom looking at me and I couldn't move. 
She freaked out, but I explained my situation and she ended up being okay with it. The last time I woke up to someone watching me, I don't think it was my mother either. I woke up in my bed on my stomach like normal and couldn't move, semi-normal. I can hear someone walking in my room, even less normal. I could hear them talking, saying, he is sleeping. I hope it's my mom. I regained my ability to move and go downstairs and I asked her if she needed me. She said no. You weren't just in my room, I asked. She said no. Okay, it must have just been my sister who came up from the basement. I asked her if she had been in my room at all. She said no.